Blog Talk Radio. And a good evening, everyone, and welcome to the King Jordan Radio Show, live for Season 6, Episode 10. It is May 2nd, 2018, here on King Jordan Radio. Check that May 3rd. Tonight on the show, we'll break down the Bill Cosby uh, case. We'll talk about appeals. We'll talk about why he got bond. We'll see if he even gets to jail. We'll talk about the Golden State Killer uh, after 40 years. Um, he was found, so that's good news. We'll also get into the case where um, our guest was on 2020 talking about it because uh, uh, she worked on the case as a uh, an attorney. Um, they call it mystery at the mansion. A woman, woman dies mysteriously in a California mansion. Um, woman's family refuses to believe that she committed suicide. And now, uh, nearly seven years after the mysterious uh, death, um, there's a civil trial and there's uh, some new evidence. And uh, we'll also get into um, this uh, Minnesota grandmother that allegedly uh, stole some identity and killed her husband. Uh, We'll get into that. Okay, so um, tonight on the program, we have – we are honored to have a legal analyst. As seen on MSNBC, ABC's 2020, uh, Fox, Good Morning America, and CNN, and much, much more. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back the one and only Anne Bremner joins us. Hello, Anne. How are you? I'm great, and it's just a pleasure and an honor to be on with you. Thank you. Absolutely a pleasure to have you. And... Uh, well, what I want to do is play a clip from this juror, and I want to get your take on Bill Cosby after this clip. We're going to move on now to our exclusive interview with one of the jurors who convicted Bill Cosby. 22-year-old Harrison Snyder sat down with Lindsay Davis, and Lindsay, he is convinced he made the right decision. That's right. No second guessing. Good morning to you, George. Harrison Snyder was the youngest of all the deliberating jurors, and at 22 years old, he wasn't even alive during the height of Cosby's fame. He also admits he wasn't very aware of the Me Too movement. And while many have said that this case came down to he said, she said, Snyder says for him, it came down to what Cosby said himself. This morning, a stunning revelation that it may have been Bill Cosby's own words that sealed his fate. What was the evidence that made you sure beyond a reasonable doubt that he was guilty? Um, I think it was his deposition, really. Ms. Cosby admitted to giving these quaaludes to women, young women, in order to have sex with them. For weeks, there was speculation about the outcome. But this morning, we hear just what was going on inside the deliberation room during Bill Cosby's retrial, thanks to juror number one, Harrison Snyder. But when you entered the room for the first time, were you sure that he was guilty? No. So what then made the difference for you once you started deliberating? Hearing everyone's comments about certain pieces of evidence and going through the different counts. So you don't feel even now that it was an open and shut case? No. The 22-year-old says prior to the trial, he didn't know much about Cosby and knew nothing about the allegations against him. I really didn't know a lot. I knew he was an actor. I knew that he did the Cosby show. I never watched the Cosby show or anything. I'm a little too young for that. What did you know about the allegations prior to becoming a juror in the case? I didn't know anything. I don't watch the news ever. So I didn't even know what he was on trial for. At Cosby's first trial last spring, the jury deliberated for more than 52 hours, but was unable to come to a unanimous decision on whether or not Cosby drugged and sexually assaulted former Temple University employee Andrea Constant at his Pennsylvania home in 2004. When Andrea was on the stand, did you believe her? Yes. What about those other five women who testified? If you hadn't heard from those other five and you just had her word, would that have mattered to you? I don't think so because in the deposition he stated that he gave these drugs to 
other women. I don't think it really necessarily mattered that these other five women were here because he said it himself that he used these drugs for other women. So you found it to be his words that were the most damning of all. Yeah. That's why we said Me Too! While many in the court of public opinion felt the Me Too movement loomed large, perhaps even helping to sway the jury. Are you well aware of the Me Too movement? Did that have any factor, would you say, in your decision? No. I really only found out about it after I got home and then I looked online to see what everything was. I didn't really even know about the Me Too movement. Snyder describes the jury as being all on the same page when it came to arriving at that unanimous guilty verdict on all three counts. Some have said that I made the right decision and some people have said that they still think that he's innocent. And I just tell them if you were there, you would say the same thing. You would say that he's guilty. Sitting here today, is there any doubt in your mind that you guys came to the right conclusion? No, I have no doubt at all. As for inconsistencies in Constant's story, Snyder says that they were explained away by the prosecution's very first witness, a sexual assault expert, who testified in uh, the, the reporting delays, uh, inconsistencies in statements, and continuing to keep in contact with the perpetrator are all normal behavior for a victim of sexual assault. But George, he says there was no dissension, no tension at all in that deliberation room. Their verdict was clear. Pretty clear. Okay, Lindsay, thanks very much. Let's talk about it now with our chief legal analyst, Dan Abrams. Not much comfort. Cosby's team can take from this? Uh, no. I mean, you know, look, defense attorneys like to try and cite what jurors say after the fact, usually ineffectively, in an appeal. But this is, uh, provides no fodder uh, for the defense at all, because he's saying it wasn't the five other women, which would be the most controversial issue uh, that was in this case versus the first case. Um, that swayed his decision. What I found so interesting is it's a reminder that expert testimony does matter, right? We always like to say, oh, you know, these experts, anyone can buy an expert, both sides. This guy's making it clear that the expert who testified about what it means to be a victim mattered to him. That it, plus Cosby's words. Plus Cosby's words, but at least it provided context for him where when the question was, well, why didn't she report it quickly? Why did it take her a year? Why did she keep calling him after the fact? These are all questions that came up in the wake of the first trial, and this guy's saying the sexual assault expert put it into context for us, first witness. And so clearly a case of first impression for this juror. Is there anything now that Cosby's team can look to to try to get to win on appeal? Yeah, the, the biggest issue, and it's not a frivolous argument, is that the five additional women who testified in this case about what they say Cosby did to them shouldn't have been allowed to testify. The argument is this is what is called pattern in practice, meaning this was his M.O. He did this all the time. That's why the judge allowed it in doesn't mean that it's still not a controversial decision. That will be the central appeal. Dan Abrams, thanks very much. You know, I was reading some things over the weekend that he, he being Bill Cosby, may not face jail time. That if you look at the judge letting him out because people thought his bail would be revoked and it wasn't. Yeah, I, I don't quite buy that. I mean, I, I wasn't surprised that he was released and I would be very surprised if he didn't serve any time in the context of this case. We'll see what happens. Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. George Okay, and uh, first of all, what do you make of the whole Cosby case, uh, and uh, what do you make of the juror of what you heard? Well, at least in this case, justice delayed wasn't justice denied. I, I wasn't surprised by the verdict, frankly, but I thought, you know, I, I, I was still kind of, when it happened, I, I was like, well, that, wow, that's great. I mean, they, they finally, a jury finally did the right thing in this case. I love that juror. He's a great juror. He's the perfect juror. He decided the case on the facts. He didn't know about the Me Too movement. He didn't look at anything outside the case. He decided it based on the case. He has no doubts. And he let the deliberations convince him. So it wasn't just what he heard, but he listened to his fellow jurors in terms of what they heard, and together they reached a verdict. So that's how the system should work. I have a lot of faith in the jury system, and especially in this particular jury. As, as far as the issue of whether or not you know, he should have had his bail revoked, you know, I thought he should have. I, I'm an old prosecutor in sex cases, and oftentimes here in Seattle and other, juris, you know, in juris, other jurisdictions, they'll let out the back door, like Nancy Grace would say, in cuffs when the jury comes back with a guilty verdict. So, but he's uh, back at home, victory, and, yeah. you know. There is, that, there is that thought that's going around some uh, analysts' mind that say he might not see jail uh, with if the judge is nice enough to let him out for this, uh, do you think it's possible to let him out while the uh, 
while they're making their appeals, the uh, lawyers. You know, given what the judge said, when, when the prosecutor asked to have the bail revoked, the judge got almost mad at the prosecutor and said, wait a minute, Cosby's shown up for all of his hearings. You haven't asked for this before. He's 80. He's in ill health. Are you kidding me? It's basically what the judge was saying. Given what the judge said, then I would not be surprised to see this judge to continue Cosby on the same amount of bail throughout an appeal, just by virtue of what we've seen evidenced by of his um, his attitude towards bail and towards towards um, Cosby. But the fact is, that the, the appeal could take you know years, and is he going to be out that whole time? Yes. A, you know, and when you look at age and you look at health, those are some things you look at, but you also look at retribution as a pur- purpose of sentencing. You look at rehabilitation. You look at you, you can look at deterrence. You know, you can look at you know restitution. There's a lot of things you look at. You don't just look at Cosby and say how was he. You look at all these other factors, but the most important being societal. Now, looking at this from a non-biased uh, opinion, what do you think that Tom Mesero and company have as their strongest case for an appeal? Well, you know you and I are big fans of Tom Mesero, <clears throat> and you know, he's yeah. the best of the best. <laughs> <laughs> he really is. And so I think the best, the, 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 the best thing he has on appeal is, of course, himself. He's excellent. But in terms of the evidence, I think like Dan Abrams said, yeah, like Dan Abrams said, five other victims, alleged victims testimony coming in under pattern or practice evidence, that's a great ground for appeal because you don't want a jury to decide guilt based on other not fully proved cases. And that's what happened here. So that would be, I think, the best bet they would have for an appeal. Yeah, you you might not see it, but you're in court there and you see five other women in addition to the only one that's being charged to come up to the scene and said, yes, he did this to me too. This happened to me. And just being an average person, you know, no matter what you say, you're, you're not going to consider whatever. Uh, you just can't help but not consider when you see five other women go up there and possibly cry and say, yes, this happened to me too. It's hard. It's hard to just ignore that. You would agree? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and and that's dangerous evidence, but it's admitted all over the country every day. You know, it happened in the Michael Jackson case. You see it in, in fact, in the Michael Jackson yeah. case. Look at that example. He, there were other quote unquote victims that came forward. They have an evidence rule in California called 1108 that lets in prior acts of pedophilia prior into evidence, acts, which right. is right prior bad acts. But it's 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 even more lenient toward the prosecution than was the rule in Cosby's case. And even there, the jury didn't convict him. They acquitted him. Well, if you remember back 13 years ago, that uh, district attorney said these things happened, but Tom has a real part in, uh, mm-hmm. I think, three of them, and they rebutted what the prosecution said, at the time at least. Uh, uh, like Macaulay Culkin got on the stand and said, no, it didn't happen to me, despite what you're saying, or your third party. What that's right. Saying. I know that's- yeah, I was at that trial. Remember? I was like, wow, yeah, yeah. Yes. Was like, that was sure backfired. It was like, here we're waiting for all this, you know, pomp and circumstance and fire and brimstone, you know, from the prosecutor. Like, look at this one and look at this one and look at what Jackson does with this one. And it was just a bare whimper in terms of evidence. And like you said, some of these claimed victims saying, I wasn't a victim at all. Why did you bring me in here? Right. And uh, that's, that's the difference, I think, between the two. Um, in my heart, there's a strong possibility I believe he did. I mean, 62 women, is, it's that number you can't get around. But a lot of people I see uh, in comments and stuff, they're saying, you know, what about this guy Harvey Weinstein who did much worse or at least the amount, same amount in that neighborhood? Why isn't he being prosecuted? That's the most... That's the most, uh, you know, trendy thing I see uh, coming off this Cosby case. Take right. On that. I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and I don't know if you saw it today, but his wife had a letter that she sent out saying that the prosecutor should be prosecuted, and basically saying that her husband was unfairly convicted and it was racial, and he was denied his constitutional rights, and the media convicted him, and that wasn't fair. And she went on and on and on, you know, about how unfair the trial was. But, you know, I, what I Cosby. do hear, like, 
this is Mrs. Camille Cosby, right? But of course, what I do here is what you said, which is, what about Weinstein? You know, what about these other cases? Well, the, the fact is, in, in our legal system, each person is treated, we're all treated equally. But you don't say, you didn't prosecute this person, therefore you can't prosecute my client unless there's some equal protection argument, which wasn't present here. And by the way, he just got kicked out of the um, academy, and so did uh, Polanski today, out of the Motion Pictures. Um, Academy of Arts and Sciences. And Polanski uh, was charged, well, was accused, I guess, of with younger girls, right? That's the accusation. Right. P- Polanski was accused of raping a 13 year old or molesting a 13 year old. He pled guilty to the charge, but while sentencing was pending, he fled the country and he was in France. And so there was never never a sentence. He had he, There was a plea bargain. The argument was he felt like the prosecutor was not going to abide by the plea bargain or the judge wouldn't, and so he fled the country. And, and then attempts at extradition have not been successful, including some more recent. And so he's been out of the country all that time. He's won an Academy Award or two since then, including some Lifetime Achievement Award, and they finally revoked his status together with Bill Cosby's. Oh, my. About time. <laughs> okay, yeah. so uh, let's <laughs> let's get into the Golden State Killers after 40 years found. Here's some uh, backstory on that. We are back now with those new details about the suspected Golden State Killer. Joseph D'Angelo is now behind bars as questions grow about how investigators tracked him down using his DNA and that genealogy website. ABC's Whit Johnson is in Ventura, California with the latest details. Good morning, Whit. Robin, good morning to you. We're learning that DNA recovered from a double murder scene here in Ventura played a critical role in cracking the cold case. Investigators say that DNA was then plugged into the genealogy website that ultimately led to a former police officer, Joseph D'Angelo. ABC News learning this morning accused Golden State killer Joseph D'Angelo is on suicide watch, alone in a jail cell after undergoing a psychiatric evaluation. Reported to appear dazed with delayed speech, the 72-year-old entered a Sacramento court Friday, handcuffed to a wheelchair. But retired investigator Paul Holes, who spent more than two decades searching for the killer and is still consulting on the case, says it's all an act. He's a dangerous man. He is not the decrepit individual that you see in the wheelchair at arraignment. He is a very spry 72-year-old that is physically capable. He has numerous guns registered to him. He says the week before the arrest, D'Angelo was seen riding a motorcycle at high speeds. He also enjoyed building and flying model airplanes, and he went to great lengths to make sure his house blended in. He is somebody that is uh, he's diligent in putting the effort out to at least maintain a facade, you know, a, a looking like a normal individual. And I believe that it possibly is part of his act. You know, he wanted to blend into this neighborhood and not be perceived as a, the monster that possibly was living within this house. And this morning, the method investigators used to find their suspect is being called into question. Plugging old crime scene DNA of an unknown attacker into the genealogy site GEDmatch, then building extensive family trees, a pool of thousands, narrowed down to a handful that investigators say ultimately led to the name Joseph D'Angelo. There's just a slippery slope of if you can use people's DNA without their consent for law enforcement, they could possibly be overreached by the government. Paul says he's the one who first pushed the idea. So what do you say to those critics who argue this is an invasion of privacy, what you did in this case? What it is is it's acting as a witness. Just like when I go up and I knock on a door and I say, hey, did you see somebody who looked like that? He said, yeah, I saw him running down the street that way. That DNA is doing the same thing, but I just don't have to talk to that person. Jedmatch telling ABC News, while the database was created for genealogical research, it is important that Jedmatch participants understand the possible uses of their DNA, including identification of relatives that have committed crimes or were victims of crimes. And the former Auburn police chief telling ABC News that investigator Paul Holes reached out to him about six weeks ago. The chief explained that D'Angelo threatened to kill him after he was fired. Investigators say that information helped narrow their focus on D'Angelo in the final days leading to his arrest. Robin? Incredible how it all came together.
Okay, and uh, first let's take it from uh, how they got this with this new high-tech technology. What's your take of that and the controversy behind it? Well, it's, it's awesome. You know, when I was a prosecutor, I remember DNA evidence was introduced right about the end of the time I was a DA, and I remember thinking, mm-hmm. we're going to be obsolete. We don't even need prosecutors. If you have DNA, then every case is going to be proved by science. You know, that didn't – obviously, look at OJ and a lot of other cases. That didn't, you know, turn out to be the case. But we have all these, you know, developments in science that are extraordinary in criminal cases, and especially this case where you catch, catch someone – decades and decades later, you know, by virtue of, of DNA. We had that here in Seattle with the Green River Killer. Remember, he, back in 1987, he was picked up. They got a small bit of his DNA and some DNA in the case. It wasn't enough to analyze. It became enough to analyze through science decades later, and then he was caught and he pled guilty to 48 murders, um, and now he's serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole. So that those kinds of developments are extraordinary and I think give us great hope that all these horrible cases at some point can be resolved. I mean, this, this was such a horrible spree of killing couples, um, killing, killing you know, families, of rape, um, of, of batteries and, and, and horrible violence, you know, in addition to you know, different types of um, weapons and things and homicides all up and down the coast of California, I mean, all through California. And so to have this resolved is pretty amazing, you know, based on his DNA and based on these ancestry websites. And I'm sorry, but whoever wants to say this is, you know, that this is the government, you know, invading your privacy, you voluntarily give your DNA to these private companies. I mean, if they go, they went through family DNA and tracked it back to him, that's fair, that's fair game. It's not like the government went out and took his DNA. And we also had one case in Seattle where we had a long unsolved murder where the Seattle police sent an envelope for this person to lick for entering a lottery or winning a lottery. He licked it. It matched the DNA in the murder. And that was upheld by the courts as legitimate. Yeah, that's totally uh, totally unbelievable. But um, let's talk about this individual guy's alleged crimes. Um, Wow, I mean... This guy would literally rape you and then call call you and leave a message like I'm gonna kill you and things like that. I mean, out of your out of all your days of uh, covering and prosecuting and right, where do you rank this guy? Uh, allegedly, of course, until he's found guilty. Uh, where do you rank him among crazy killers, if you will? The worst of the worst. I mean, the absolute worst of the worst. He was, and I don't know if you read this, King, but he had that whole thing about his fiance Bonnie had rejected him, and so then he would say, "This is for Bonnie." At some of these scenes, you know, I mean, just How bizarre I behavior with the name too. Bonnie. Right, exactly. You know, and it's just like, <laughs> I mean, th- th- this guy, you know, it was a real reign of terror for a really long time, and that's part of it too, is that all the families didn't know and that these gruesome circumstances and who is this person and to just like with the Green River Killer you know and other cases that get resolved after a long period of time just knowing who that monster is and knowing where their loved one is you know just some of those it doesn't give anyone closure but they need people need to know these things I mean they're tortured for the whole lifetimes and he tortured these people terribly yes and uh, how old is he now Probably. He is only like 72. That's the other thing with the lawyers saying, you know, oh, look at him. You know, he's, he's 72. He's in a wheelchair. 72 is nothing. I mean, I try cases. Right. Like Gloria Allred's older than that. I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> uh, she is. So, mm-hmm. so so Tom Mesro's not older than that. But, you know, just, I mean, there's plenty of people in their 70s, 80s, 90s doing beautifully these days. You know, I mean, it, when they That's said that, I'm like, true. are you are you kidding me? That's nothing. Right. There, there are people in their 60s, 70s, and even 80s that are in great phenomenal shape. Uh, but they, a lot of people are saying this guy's putting on an act with the wheelchair and, you know, not sure. pretending not to hear. And uh, I guess a lot of people would do that in that situation, but this looks like a real act, wouldn't you think? 
Oh, there's no question. And, you know, we just went through this with Bill Cosby, you know, where he says he can't see. And, and, and even Weinstein said that. Remember Weinstein? What didn't he say he couldn't see? You know, some, maybe I'm not thinking of the right thing. But anyway, I know that Cosby says he can't see. And then he didn't, shouldn't have a trial because he yeah. couldn't see the witnesses. He lost his and then, as soon as the uh, trial started. Right. <laughs> and then he had the cane. You know, but a lot of, you know, sharp court watchers would say he wasn't using the cane. It was just a prop. And then, you know, he's like all decrepit and everything else. And he's probably sprinting into his house every night. We don't know. But, you know, he's a pretty spry guy at 80. And and it's almost like, you know, 80 and 70, that's the new 50 these days. 90, all of my aunts <laughs> yeah. and my grandmas were all up to be, lived to be 99 and 100. So, and they did great at that age. So, 72, he's got a long ways to go before he's really supposed to be, I think, in a wheelchair. Uh, no question about it, and uh, you know, the, I heard that uh, I read that Bill Cosby was offered to plead guilty and just to do home arrest. You know, that was part of the deal. I heard uh, he was telling some news story. Allegedly, he said no to that, and you know, at eighty, you know, staying home and. You know, it's not like having anything better than being in jail when you compare the two. Um, but I, I was kind of surprised he didn't take that. Were I'm you? shocked. I'm, I'm shocked, King. I think he should grab that in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat, and run. But he, it's too late now, obviously. But he did right. have this opportunity when the original trial first started. Um, he was speaking. To an exclusive newspaper, and they recently released some of that information. And uh, he said basically, I'm not going to plead guilty to something I didn't do. But, uh, you know, he would, I guess he felt that uh, he'd have to admit, you know, to, uh, to these crimes. Uh, well, was what, so he was only being charged with one person. Uh, only one, I'm saying, because it's 62. But um, I, I might have advised him to take that if I was his counsel. Would you have? Oh, I definitely would have. Well, I, I represent one of his victims here in Seattle, and she's not part of the 60. She'd be number 61. That she, the statute of limitations, oh, okay. run here. You know, so it's like I look at Bill Cosby, and maybe, maybe that you've heard that phrase phrase, you know, pride cometh before the fall. I mean, that's, I think that's what mm-hmm. happened to him. You know, he's he just let that get in the way. And and it, all he needed to do was say what he said in the deposition already, you know, that I gave drugs to women to have sex with them. He already said that under oath. He could say that again and stay home for the rest of his life. But he chose to have a trial. Yes. And uh, he'll probably be uh you know, in 60 days or so, uh, being sentenced. Yeah. You know, what what happens, what we discussed. But the the thing about him is is that, you know, it's it's like that, you know, show me a hero and I'll write you a tragedy. You know, he goes through all of this and his whole life is ruined. Nobody likes him. People think he's disgusting, you know, everything. Michael Jackson went through his trial and he came out far differently. You know, some and O.J. Simpson, yes. of course, came out far differently. I mean, look at the way that Bill Cosby's mm-hmm. handled this. It's not just the way he's handled it in court, but what he said publicly and kind of the arrogance and the disdain, you know, that he's had. Yes. And so, you know, you just have to look at that, too. It's not just what he did in court. It's what he said outside of court and how he handled it over the last few years. Yes, he was kind of like a little disrespectful to the court, some would say, uh, laughing um, out of context and... Just don't you remember? Wild, uh, don't you remember? Don't you remember what he said at the end when the prosecutor said he had a private plane? He called the prosecutor oh, yeah, an a hole. Oh really lost it. Yeah. Yes. Then it became personal, I guess, and from his standpoint, uh, he was going to go out with a fight, but uh, I'm surprised right. that alone didn't like change the, uh, you know, thoughts of the the uh, judge there uh, from putting him right in jail, but. Uh, yeah, I guess it looks. I guess it looks better that, he, from the judge's standpoint, that they 
he thinks he does, did the right thing, you know. Yeah, I know, but oh. we'll see yeah, what happens. Yeah, a lot of people have different opinions. Stay tuned. Yeah. All right. So a couple months back, you were on ABC's 2020 talking about the mystery at the mansion was the title, A Woman Dies Mysteriously uh, in uh, California Mansion. Mm-hmm. The dead woman's family refuses to believe that she actually committed suicide, like the uh, police over there said. Uh, that was about seven uh, years after the mysterious death. And you were involved with this case uh, very much. So why don't you give the uh, audience this a little layout of the uh, of what happened seven years ago? Sure. Sure. So seven years ago, Thanks. Rebecca Sahau, um, who was the girlfriend of a millionaire billionaire, um, Jonas Shackney, they lived together in a mansion in Coronado, California. The son of Shackney had fallen down the stairs. He was six, Max and was very seriously injured. So there was the hospital vigil, um, you know, lots of stress in the house, etc. cetera. Shaq and I had his brother, Adam, a ship's uh, um, tugboat captain, come out for support from Tennessee. They all go out to dinner one night. Later, the next day, Rebecca Zahau is found hanging from a Juliet balcony of the mansion, naked, with her feet bound together with Siemens type expert knots, her hands tied together in a similar fashion, a gag in her um, mouth, um, and her feet not touching the ground, just from the second story balcony, with a saying written in paint on the door in the bedroom from which she was hung, she saved him, can you save her? The police investigated, mm-hmm. um, and of course then the boy dies the next day from his injuries, Max, it's a horrible situation. The police investigated the the situation. They closed it out as a suicide right away, even though she hadn't been depressed, even though she couldn't tie her hands and legs together like that and hoist herself off the balcony, even though there there was no um, disturbance of the dust on the balcony from someone standing going over the side, Um, even though the lividity where your blood settles when you die was in her back, and even though she was strangled and killed, before she went over the side. So lividity was not in her feet from being hang, hung. She, she had, had been strangled. She didn't die from hanging. And there was um, no evidence whatsoever of suicide to close it out. I worked with the family for a long time to try and get the suicide finding set aside and to get the case investigated. I brought in Dr. Sal Weck, famed um, pathologist. I brought in criminalists. We were able to show that the... Um, the tying to the bed, it was staged. The bed only was moved a couple inches. It was picked up and moved. Actually, with an experiment of a dummy that size, it would have moved three feet. That, there, that the doors were closed behind her, like when she went over the side, like these double doors, French doors, like she could do that. There was sand in the bottom of her feet. That Witnesses right around the house heard her crying for help around the time of the hanging. That even the brother, um, he said he was looking at porn on his phone um, in the guest house before he came and cut her down. I think in a way to say if his DNA was found in her, he could explain it because he was you know, using this to pleasure himself, et cetera, et cetera. He put her on a table and only had three legs. You know, he stood on that to cut her down, but only had three legs, so he couldn't have. You know, I could go on and on. There was mm-hmm. evidence with blood, and it was a, a knife. Um, handle was put in her vagina, and she was sexually assaulted. There was blood in the shower. The police just said it's a suicide, and I took it to the DA in San Diego County. I took it all the way to the AG, Camilla Harris. I brought in a lawyer, Moody, uh-huh. Rudy, um, Madoy, R- Marty Rodoy from down there, to help me. We had lengthy um, submissions to the Attorney General to get this thing reopened, reassigned, etc. Then we brought in a civil lawyer, Keith Greer. He recently tried the civil case. He did a great job. And the brother was found liable for her death. And they, the jury said it was also a homicide, not a suicide. So the theory was it was the brother. Uh, you, you and the others uh, on your team there thought, right? Was responsible. Right. Exactly. Well, he, he, he was an expert in those types of nautical knots. He, even his writing was his, was, that was his writing on that door, even of his height. And an expert talked about it, the similarities with what, you know, he could do. 
Um, there was, he said he gave her mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. There was no DNA, DNA on her. So how could that have happened, you know, if, if he indeed did that? And he took a polygraph examination. It was inconclusive, but an expert was brought in from Greer, Greer that actually said he flunked that polygraph. That's my understanding. So all of that circumstantial mm. evidence was taken to a jury, and they, they, they listened to all the evidence, and they found him to be responsible and awarded $5 million. And the really great news is, is the sheriff's department is now reopening the case, hey, uh, like, we asked them to, like we asked them to do a long time ago. From your standpoint, when you first hear about all this uh, evidence and whatnot, were you actually surprised that the VA over there didn't prosecute the uh, brother right away? Yes. I, I couldn't believe they couldn't even prosecute because they closed the case. So they weren't, they weren't investigating. They did the scene. You know, they did some perfunctory work, but not the full investigation you would see in a homicide investigation because they called it a suicide. So where does the family go from here? I mean, they got well, the civil suit that they wanted, but they got is what they wanted—the civil, civil suit. But they want accountability in the criminal justice system. So we hope that the sheriff's office—I should say—they hope the sheriff's office fully looks at this case. The sheriff stands election on June 5th. He has an opponent who has promised to open the investigation. So I'm not sure who's going to win that. But the family wants to see a full and fair investigation of the entire case. You know, it's been far too long, and it took a civil case and a lot of publicity and a lot of, you know, national publicity for this to happen. How old was the uh, kid and the uh, mother? He was six, and she was 33. Six and 33, respectively? Yes. Wow. What a tragedy. It's horrible. It's so a tragedy, and, and, and Rebecca's family, you know, especially her sister Mary, never gave up. She never gave up, and I'm so impressed with her. And her husband, Doug, who's a police officer, they never gave up, you know, seeking justice in her name. Yeah. Did you ever come to a motive for this uh, brother? Sex. That's what Greer said, mm. <clears throat> Keith Greer. But part of the motive, too, was that the little boy was in the hospital you know, near death, <clears throat> and one of the doctors supposedly told the family that he'd been suffocated. And that was wrong. He hadn't been. But that was what was you know, part of the case. And so another theory was that the brother you know, was avenging this somehow, you know, that, that, that she was the one that was responsible because she was there when he fell. She's the one taking care of Max. Rebecca, and so that somehow he felt, you know, that he needed revenge on her, you know, or that he needed to do something because of what happened to Max. Just a sad case. You did a great job on that uh, 2020 show. So, okay. uh, you know, yeah. Okay, let's talk about the accused killer grandmother. He has some time <laughs> to talk. The accused grandma killer, Lois Reese, appears via closed circuit TV in a Florida courtroom for the first time since she was extradited back to the Fort Myers area. Prosecutors claim she is refusing to take her psychiatric medication. The state respectfully submits that this is a factor that the court should take into account in the amount of, in, first of all, considering whether to grant bond and considering the amount of bond. The judge decided Reese will be held without bond until her next court appearance within the week. Reese is accused of killing her husband in Minnesota before assuming the identity of lookalike Pamela Hutchinson from Florida and killing her as well. Reese, who was on the run from cops for two weeks, was later captured in Texas. She faces numerous charges, including homicide. Prosecutors in Minnesota say they are also building a case against Reese for the shooting death of her husband. For InsideEdition.com, I'm Lee Shep. Okay, and this is a crazy uh, situation with this <laughs> grandmother. What do you make of it? <laughs> well, first of all, I know I just like it's crazy. She's like only fifty six years old, right? I think that's her age. Yeah. Uh, but I look at her and I yeah, think Yeah, kinda young for a grandmother. For a grandma and, and it's also like I don't know if you know the answer to this, King, but has she like no prior criminal history and all of a sudden she goes on this crime spree at fifty six? I don't know. Unusual. But yeah, I mean, it's like yeah, it's like <laughs> crazy to, like, steal the identity of someone, kill him, and then kill her husband, and, you know, everything else. The only thing I yeah, can think of is... Yeah, usually it's a nice 
<laughs> track what? past it. Usually yeah. there's a past it when you get to the fifties at least. You know, that's that's it's, very uh unusual. It is and, and then for her <laughs> just to, to commit these homicides and to kill someone to get their identity. I mean that's that's amazing. Well to kill her husband's amazing too. Yeah, I mean this is like one of the most heinous crimes and uh like you said, she did absolutely nothing uh, well, she never got caught at least if she did. Uh in terms of getting in trouble with the law. So we'll see where this uh case goes. Yeah, okay, she's, let's uh yeah, I, she's she's just in a lot of trouble, that's all I can say. Yeah. All right, let's uh, bring in Sarah to the conversation. She's going to say hello. Uh, Sarah joins us. Hi, Sarah. Hi, hi Jordan. Hi, Ann. Hi, uh, Sarah. Hope you are all both hi. well. Great talking to you. Um, I just have a little question about Rebecca Zahal. Hopefully, hopefully a, a real criminal investigation will will take place, and it. it you know, it's disheartening sometimes that it takes a long time for justice, but it can happen. And um, my question was, in the investigation that took place, because obviously they closed it as a suicide, in the any kind of investigation that you were involved in, was the rope that was used, was it part of the household, was it recently purchased, and did they ever find out who purchased the rope? And the same thing with the paint. I mean, little Max, six years old, he could have been playing with paint and everything. But I was just curious, in a civil investigation, do they look at those kinds of details and link those things to someone? They, they, they couldn't. There was similar rope that was purchased in Coronado, around near Coronado, but it wasn't established where they got this rope. There was a blank part of a shelf in the garage where there had reportedly been like um boating ropes this was uh-huh. red this was red rope um so they never really established they did establish with experts in in my case the criminal criminal case and in the civil trial that these knots were very particular they were nautical and they were not the kind that she knew how to do they were the kind right. that adam knew what to do but also that she couldn't have tied herself up like that i mean she couldn't have done yeah. her hands that way and her feet etc so that was the rope evidence when you, when you look at the um, paint evidence, they found a receipt for the paint brushes and some paint in the console of one of the cars of, of um, Adam and Rebecca's, or excuse me, Joan and Rebecca's. But that was about it. Um, she liked oh. paint. That was something she liked to do. So that, that the oh. paint and paint brushes were something that wouldn't be unusual. And mm-hmm. this was in the maid's room, which is in the center of the house. That's where she, the balcony was. So she wasn't mm-hmm. back in her bedroom. It was just, it was, it was a maid's room where um, some of the paint um, brushes and paint, that's where they were. But those are well, great questions. I, but that, that they never established, you know, anything about this particular rope where it came from to answer that part yeah. of your question. Well, thank you for that. And, and I, I, I truly, truly hope that there will be um, a, a bigger and better investigation than before because – it's just amazing that there's no fingerprints anywhere on None. anything. Right. And, yeah, and, like, I don't know if someone was going to kill themselves. Would they have the wherewithal to wipe fingerprints off of everything? I just don't think so. Well, not only that, but, but anyway, how, did she, how did she heave herself, you know, from the floor of the bedroom right. over that railing, you know, without leaving? Yeah. And when she's all tied up like that. I mean, yeah. but so many you, questions. Oh, and then the part so about questions. the knife. I mm-hmm. you know I I must have missed that detail or maybe it wasn't disclosed in any of the the um TV shows that have been it's in the um, trial. Yeah. yeah. Um so who's going to do yeah, who's going to do that to themselves? Well yeah, and oh, that, boy. The, that came through Keith Greer's I didn't have that either in my case when Keith Greer went to his criminalist, his blood expert and said here's some of the evidence. That expert said look at this, you know what I see in this knife? And she said, I find this consistent with the sexual assault of, of Rebecca. I didn't have mm. that in my case. No, I didn't know that. I didn't have anybody in my experts say, Ann, look at this. But that's what he mm. had, and that's what he presented in the trial. Wow. I know, it's pretty well, amazing. Well, good work. 
good work, Anne. I always Thank enjoy you. seeing you and hearing what you have to say. And Thanks so um, much. As, well, you're welcome. And as far as the Bill Cosby trial, um, I am very, very curious as to what his sentencing will be. And I hope that this verdict just speaks so loudly to so many women that have not come forward, not regarding him, but in general. And and I just would hope that the hashtag me too would have a comma and say hashtag me too comma right now and report it right now. Mm-hmm. So, great point. so that all of these 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 criminals you know, can get their uh, can get their day in court, and the victims will will get justice and not have to suffer in silence. Anyway, nice talking to you, and um, take some more calls. And Jordan, thank you so much. Thank you. No, thank okay. you. Wonderful yeah, point. So much for checking. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, we have uh, Stewart in New York. Let's go back to Stewart. Hi, Stuart. You're on yeah. the phone with Ann Bremner. Yeah. Hi, Jordan. Hi, hi, Ann. Um, hi, Stuart. On, on the uh, on the on 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 the uh, Bill Cosby. You know, you know, growing up, I, I used you know I used to watch the show with my family, and it's and it's uh, really sad. I I, uh, I it's really sad, and uh, I understand he you know he did these things, and and he deserves to suffer the uh, the consequences. But I just I just can't believe the uh, the downfall. I mean, for people out there that think that he'll serve no jail time because of his age. But, but you know, you, you got to uh, remember that the fact that Jerry Sandusky received a, le- a lengthy uh, prison sentence at the, at, the, at the time he was pushing 70. So I, I think no judge nor anyone else should uh, take kindly to these uh, sexual assault cases. I mean, Kazi will be sentenced. Mm-hmm. But, but, you know, but... But the but public cases like this one will hopefully help you know help discourage such behavior. Now, that's a great point. I mean, when I was talking earlier about deterrence, you know, and the thing is, look at the fall he's taken. That's huge. Would that happen to my neighbor? You know, if they went through this, no. It happened to Bill Cosby because of who he is. He had everything, and now he has nothing. So of right. course, that punishment is so severe, and we wouldn't see that. You know, with with somebody that's not in, in such a huge position of public profile, so those are ex- excellent points. I mean, I mean, I mean, no one wants to be abused. I mean, these women were were broken spirit for years, and and my hope for them is that they will be able to uh, move on, you know, and uh, you know, rebuild their lives and and you know, get get back back to you know to normal after all of this uh, you know trauma they have ex- experienced. And also, I've read that the, in terms of the uh, statute of limitations, mm-hmm. that while varying state to state, you know, does not extend that far. I understand, I think for, for Pennsylvania, the statute of limitations for criminal is you have up, up until the age of 50. Is that for Pennsylvania? Would you? Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if it's, if it's up to that age, but the statute in Pennsylvania had not expired when they charged him. And the statute in my state it has expired on a case like that a long time ago. Like so, every state's different, and California just got rid of their statutes of limitations. Other states have too, a number of states, but that doesn't go retrospectively. It's only in the future. So, you know, you can't go back to a case like Bill Cosby and say you get the longer statute. There was an right. argument over the statute too. Remember, with the change of DAs in an election there, and the old DA didn't want to prosecute it. Remember, and the new DA in the election said he did want to prosecute it, and he's the one that won. So, so for, for Pennsylvania, the, the, the criminal for, for statute of limitations is up to age of fifty. Is that, is that that's what I heard? That's what I heard. That's I don't what know. I, I don't okay. know. Do you know King? Uh, no, I think it was they just got it in. I think it went by years, uh, mm-hmm. twelve years. It was oh four, and they got it in just as we were going to that's twenty sixteen. Right. If I remember right. Yeah. So they barely got it in, but they just got it in just in time. That's what I oh. remember too. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Stuart. Okay, uh, Mary left a message. She's uh, flying. She wanted me to ask you this. 
Okay, the question is, why do some judges allow previous bad acts to come into a current trial and others don't? That is what lost the case for Bill Cosby. It's a great question. I guess you're asking him. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, the prior you know, the, bad acts. The prior bad acts. The, the answer is it's always a discretionary call. And a judge has to weigh right. how probative that evidence is versus how prejudicial it may be. And so every judge is different. Every case is different. And every set of those prior bad act witnesses and their evidence can be different. And more often than not, in my experience, you see judges letting that kind of evidence in, but not letting in a lot of it. Just trying to balance you know, the fairness equation in limiting the number of those types of witnesses when looking at the fairness to the accused when they're confronted with you know, other pattern type evidence. And it's been around for a long time. You know, it's something that's been used for many years because other bad acts can be used to show a common scheme or plan. That's one use of it. There's other uses too. But that common scheme, scheme or plan, if it's present, and it was with him, with drugs, you know, with the circumstances um, of saying they could be a model or be on his show or be his, he'd be their mentor, you know, that he'd wear the robe, you know, he'd give him the drug, you know, he'd be at the house, you know, he wore the hat. I mean, whatever those things are, they're so similar that you see a pattern, and that's why the evidence came in. Some judges... You know, look at that kind of evidence, and they think it's always too prejudicial. But those judges are a real minority. Yeah. You know, was, do you know if this was the same judge from the first trial that was a, turned out to be a mistrial? Let me think. I think it was. I, it, it, it was so the same judge. Judge Kelly, I think, or Michael Kelly. Right. He didn't allow – well, he only allowed one person in addition to Mrs. Constant testified right. in that first trial and I don't think he allowed the uh, testimony of uh, Bill Cosby's 2005 depo if I remember correctly that in the have first come in. trial that should have come in in both right. trials but uh, yeah you see what happened though on the second trial most of the time advantage goes to the prosecution look at the Menendez I agree. brothers uh, mm-hmm case going back uh, 89 they get a lot of stuff most of the stuff to to, to get them an acquittal or it allowed in you know the people that you know could attest to uh, the uh, bad behavior by uh, the father or whatnot they weren't able right. to speak to that if you remember so oh, yeah, it would, it's interesting not only that, on these uh, that, second cases that was, that, exactly it always gets better for the prosecution that was the same judge and the judge that was like, after that first judge, it was covered by Court TV, their first, I think, Court TV um, televised yeah. trial, is that in the second trial, he said no Court TV, no cameras, and then he severely limited the evidence about abuse with witnesses and things. And then, of course, the right. first jury was a hung jury, two hung juries that convened two juries, and the second one was a conviction. Yeah, I mean, they did that reenactment uh, show, and they really showed how feisty that lawyer was for mm-hmm. uh, the Menendez brothers. If you remember, I watched it. Mm-hmm. It's great. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it was great. Okay, and I want to thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I want to tell the fans where you'll be uh, this week, whether it's on the uh, box or the upcoming week where they can look for you. Um, I'm on a number of documentaries, but you've probably seen them. And on, I was on one from the Menendez brothers, and then Prime Time 2020, and there's some more coming out on Rebecca Zahow, and I have one coming up on Ted Bundy, who's again from my neighborhood here. And just I've been doing wow. some MSNBC on Cosby, and uh, also on Donald Trump and Michael Cohen. So that's probably where, uh-huh. where you'll that's see me. Handful with that one. <laughs> yeah, it's a real handful. <laughs> As, as developments, you know, occur, then I, I go on the air and have to really be, you know, sharp on my feet. But it's always a pleasure to be on with you. And your callers have the best questions yeah. and comments. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on. You did a wonderful job as usual. And, well, you're wonderful. Uh, we'll definitely get you back on. You're Thanks. awesome, too. Okay, Thank and you. And have a great weekend. You, too. Thanks so much. Bye. Okay. 
That was the wonderful and talented Ann Bremner as she joined us as we talked about the uh, Cosby case, the Golden State Killer, the Mystery Mansion uh, case. Um, such great stuff uh, that we spoke about, the grandma in Minnesota. Um, so, uh, as usual, let me give out some shout outs. Mary, who couldn't join us tonight, Wainwright. Uh, Sarah Kardashian, Maddie, Sharon, Vicky, Lisa, Pager, Phil, Lorraine, and Doreen, who I saw post something beautiful on her Facebook site about her son. So a mad shout out to you, uh, Doreen. Okay, so since it's Throwback Thursday, I want to go back to 1999, summer of 1999, when it was Mambo number five was at the top of the chart. One of my favorites. We'll see you next time on King Jordan Radio. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>